Here we go. I'm here with Scott Clare, old friend of mine. We've been know, known each other for a long time. And there's a couple things I wanted to talk to you about why I reached out to you is one, your blog post about the super squats program and how that's been bastardized and how few people understand how to put that together. Let, let's start with what exactly is the super squats program? You want to describe it? Yeah, it's basically a, uh, it's just a, a, an assault on the legs. You know, it's, uh, it starts out that the whole purpose of the program is you're squatting three times a week is what the book recommends. And you're doing one primary set of squats for 20 reps. Now, the key is in order to ensure the loading is appropriate, the book says in the book by Randy Strassen, uh, you start out with a load that you can do for 10 reps and you make yourself get 20 with it. Right. And then every workout you add five pounds. Now, that, that's brutal because that, that first week, that first set of 10, I mean, you're, you're breathing in between you know, reps to get those 20 and then you got to add five pounds every workout. And that's right. why you and I were talking before we went on air. It's meant to be done for about six weeks. You know, this isn't like a, it's not a six month program. Like you said, it's not a long term. It's meant to be just an absolute slap in the face for gaining mass. And the kicker is when you're doing the program, you need to maximize nutrition and you need to maximize recovery. You got to make sure you're slamming down the calories to promote growth. And you got to make sure that you're not, you know, that's not the time to start training for a marathon or, you know, doing anything like that. And in fact, the the rest of the workout is really just ancillary stuff for the yeah. upper body and a little bit of ab work. You know, just it's like, it's like maintenance for the upper body because the whole right. idea behind the workout is to stimulate massive amounts of growth with that main set of 20 on the squat. Right, right. I did the program. I mean, I've done it a couple of times over the years. I haven't done it recently. But when I first looked at the program in Randall's book, I go, man, that's not a lot of upper body stuff. I'll, I'll just add some more, right? This was my mentality going in. But once I did that squat set, I didn't, I didn't want to do anything else. I didn't even want to do the pullovers he recommended. I just wanted yeah. to go home. I could barely stand. You know, so forget yeah. about it. So I know. And then I understood clearly why it's only, I think it's one or two sets of just a few upper body exercises. Yeah. Just a push and a pull, you know, some ab work. Yeah. And if you didn't do any of that, if you just did the squats and then the pullovers, you'd probably be okay. Yeah. It's such a brutal program. And the squat in a lot of ways is a full body exercise. Your upper body supporting the weight. It's not just a leg move. I mean, it's a, that's why it's such a powerful mass builder. You build mass everywhere when you do really heavy yeah. squats. But I think the salient point is you take your 10 rep max and then you do 20 reps. So it's one rep, three breaths at the top, two rep number two, then another three breaths. It's almost like kettlebell sport, how you rest in between reps. Yeah, it's a good minutes. analogy. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's similar to that. So that's because when you look at it, you go, how am I going to do 20 reps with my 10 rep max? <laughs> but you're yeah. doing it in a different style. And what, what I would recommend most people do, but rather than just diving into the program, is do a little bit of a ramp up phase, meaning you do a workout, you do, instead of taking your 10 rep max, just take a weight that's even easier than that. Just get used to doing 20 reps. So let's say yeah. your 10 rep max is 225 pounds. First workout, just do 135, just to get used to doing 20 reps. Because if you haven't, if you've never done 20 reps on squats, I don't even care if it's fairly light, it's gonna, it's gonna be pretty brutal. Just like the small off program, the small off program, the biggest mistake people make is, and it's mainly guys who make this mistake, is they overestimate what their max is. They go, well, you know, I think my max is 495, a max they've never done. They're just pulling it out there. And then they go, yeah, that program sucks. It doesn't work. And it's like, no, you didn't, you didn't work it properly. That's why it didn't work for you. It would have been better to go in the other direction where you do a conservative max, similar to what Jim Wendler recommends for 531. Yeah. You go take 90% of your one rep max and then use that to calculate the percentages. Because yeah. he knows that most people aren't going to be accurate. It reminds sure. me of, I think it was Men's Fitness Magazine, one of these magazines, where they would come up to people on the street, ask them what their bench press max is, and then they would take them into the gym, you know, right afterwards. It wasn't not, quite that. Not one person. First of all, I'm not even. First of all, I'm not sure I even believe this happened. Can you imagine them doing that? You're just going up to people on the street. It's like, okay, come on into this gym real quick. Well, let, <laughs> yeah. Let's say theoretically it did happen. No, no one's numbers matched up because people yeah. always exaggerate what they can do especially when they don't think they're in a position where they're going to have to demonstrate it. Someone's just asking you somewhere. It's like, oh, okay, let's go in the garage right now. You know, see if you can do that. Oh, wait a minute. You know, I got a little bit of a pectare here. You know, I'm recovering. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the injuries start coming out of the woodwork. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. So that that's my that's my recommendation with super squats though is you want to I would do maybe two weeks of just ramping it up and then you start that six week program. You know, you that, that's not a bad idea because especially if you're coming from a program of, of low reps, you know, if you've been working say triples or fives, exactly. 20 reps is ju- just having the ability to do, you know, 20 reps in succession, having that muscular endurance, that's a completely different skill set. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you squat, let's say 405 for a couple sets of three, and that's relatively easy for you. And then one day you decide to switch it up and you just do 225 for 20 reps. You're going to be crazy sore after that, even oh, if yeah. it doesn't feel that heavy on your back. And it's because you may not have endurance either. That's the other factor. 20 Good reps, point. just because you have high strength, it doesn't mean that you're just going to be able to rep it out without yeah. the endurance. Yeah. So what's what really bothers you about how you've seen a lot of people bastardize this program? So what what's what really bothers you about uh, what you going on? Yeah, I mean, it's it's like it's when when people take a program and they start tinkering with it, you know, is the is the basis of it. But I mean, there's a reason that the program is laid out, you know. And if you follow Ironman, you follow Strassen's work. I mean, he right. he's he's done the work for you. Just follow right. the program. And then the article that really kind of uh, set me off about it was uh, it was CrossFit. It was from their like Box Wad magazine or something like that. It came up in my Google News feed. So I read it because it was something about the super squat program. I'm like, oh, this will be interesting. And I read it, and it was basically this guy taking super squats, pushing it to four days a week, and then trying to get all CrossFit with it, you know, where you're working in with wads and stuff like that. And I mean, you know, we, we can save the CrossFit bashing, but I mean, the whole, you know, the whole idea of the program is restoration and recovery. And that's not what wadding in a CrossFit gym is about. You know, the, they pride themselves on getting worn down, you know, the Metcon work, things like that. And that's fine. You know, I mean, if that's, that's your training goal, but it, 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 it conflicts with the purpose of super squats. So if you can do super squats with the program, you're not doing super squats as it's intended to be done. Right, right, exactly. And then there's a lack of giving credit to sources as well. Oh, yeah, yeah, whoever, absolutely. Whoever we came up with this program probably either read Strassum's book or someone who had read his book told them about it. But somehow it's probably connected to the book at some point. But yet there's there's no clear lineage of where credit is coming from. Let's and that's say I looked, up the, uh, I looked up the author. I looked up the author, and he looks like he needs to do a few rounds of super squats as it's purposely <laughs> written. Well, that's the yeah. other thing that's funny in our industry is that a lot of people who write training programs – not only are these programs that they've never done, no one's ever done these programs before. It's just stuff they're putting out there. And it's, it's really easy to just be a strength coach who's never trained anyone. You never had any clients. You just read a couple of books, and then you modify a couple of things. You go, here's a really good program based on nothing. There's nothing yeah. to substantiate. I mean, it may be a good program, but it'll just be by default, not because you've substantiated it in any way. At the very least, you should have done the program that you're recommending, you know, and then you can just frame it from that point. You can just say, Hey, look, I'm not a trainer. I'm just a guy who likes to work out and here's a program I put together and here's what I got out of it. There's plenty of people who do that. Someone like Steve Justa, his books are basically just chronicles of different programs he's tried. As far as I know, he's not someone who really trains anyone else, certainly not professionally. Sure. And, you know, to that point, Mike, I remember, uh, listening to Louis Simmons talk about, you know, using bands and chains. And he talked about when the gym started experimenting with chains, he used them for like a year or maybe even longer in the gym. And they went to, I think like four or five major meets as a team, you know, with training with chains and experimenting and seeing how it affect training before he even started writing articles in powerlifting USA about using chains to accommodate. He didn't just get this idea, then start writing about it. I mean, they experimented for a long time, you know, at West side before he even had, and, and that's, that's how, that's how any writing should be. You know, you should have some sort of empiric, not saying everything needs to be a scientific study, but you should have some empirical data from yourself, the right. people you train, the athletes you work with before you start writing about this stuff. Yeah, uh, that's, that's a great point. And I think the thing about Louis also is that he didn't set out to be world renowned or famous from no. what I see. That wasn't his goal. He just loves strength training, powerlifting, getting as strong as possible. If it were just him and his guys at his gym and no one else ever knew about it, he'd probably be okay with that. You know, as long as they're setting PRs and they're enjoying it. So that that the mindset of him wasn't, okay, I'm going to start coming up with some innovative ways and that's how I'm going to make my name and then I'm going to build this empire, right? I doubt I I mean that's what happened for him, but it happened as an organic side effect of the fact that he just loves building strength finding yep. innovative ways to get as strong as possible. 
Yeah, and, and I think you know it's just as a result of the the things that he and his lifters experienced over the years. You know, I mean, if you're producing the results and the numbers that they produced for decades, people are going to start asking questions. People are going to want to know, and then that you know it sm- snowballs from there. You know, to what we have today, but. That's a good point. And that's when people start asking you what you're doing, then you know you're on the right track. Yep. When you have to convince people to listen to what you're doing, then you're probably not on, especially in strength and fitness, then you're probably not on the right track or whatever. Yeah. You know, we could even say that about, that's why a lot of people, we're both on a vegan diet, we're both plant based. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people, I shouldn't say a lot of people, but some people, pitch other people on the merits and why they should do it. They go, here's all the animal cruelty reasons, here are the health benefits and so forth. And they may be, they may be making all the right points, but they don't, they're not practicing what they're preaching or they don't have the results, the personal results to back it up. So it's not a strong argument. The other person may even think, hey, I like what you're saying, but I'm looking at you and you don't look too healthy. Yeah. Now, now, tra- now contrast that with, you don't talk about it at all, but you exude health, you have a positive energy people want to be around it like hey what do you do what's your diet like oh i don't eat meat at all i do this that and so forth whoa really that works and then 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 you have someone who's actually actively listening so i'm not saying that people shouldn't initiate whatever strategy they feel comfortable doing if you want to talk to people about whatever go ahead and do it I, i just don't think it's as effective when you're not healthy so if you're saying it, and the, the animal cruelty reasons, I get 100%. That's why I got into it, and I believe that's why you got into it as well. I wasn't thinking, yeah. okay, God, this is going to be the healthiest diet in the world. I wasn't even thinking about that. <clears throat> but if you do, if you, if people, I think a lot of people will say, okay, I get it. I don't want to harm animals either, but I also don't want to be unhealthy myself. I don't want to lose muscle mass. I don't want to... I don't want to have my nails breaking. I just don't want to have all the signs of being unhealthy. Then it's going to be a detriment or it's going to be an, in, 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 it's going to be something that impedes moving that Absolutely. forward. But if you embody health, then it's a much easier argument. Now it starts becoming, now the other person starts becoming inquisitive going, wow, this guy's actually making it work or this lady's making it work. Let me look into what they're doing. And when someone else starts looking into it, that's the sign that they're on the right track. Well, now you, now you have a, uh, the opportunity for a conversation. You know, if, if I go up to some Joe Blow in the gym and I say, hey, look, man, I eat a plant-based diet. You know, here's why you should go vegan, blah, blah. They're not going to listen to you, no, no. you know. But when I'm training with somebody and they say, wow, you got a little bit of muscle or your conditioning's really good or, you know, train jiu-jitsu. It's like, wow, you got some good energy and stuff like that. You know, what do you do for your, what do you do for nutrition? And I tell them like, whoa, you know, how do you do that? You know, how do you get protein or how do you, you know, they ask a lot of the same questions, you know, or whatever. But, but again, now we're having a conversation. And right. they've got some interest, you know. Right. And you probably have a lot of clients that are just coming to you for strength and conditioning. They're not coming to you necessarily to design a, a vegan diet for them or a plant-based diet. But it yep. probably comes up organically throughout the course, especially if someone you've been training, let's say, several sessions. It probably starts coming up. Hey, what about nutrition? And then, and then it's probably, like you said, it's a conversation now, though. So it's more impactful. Exactly. And I I don't, if you just bombarded them from session one, oh, by the way, let me talk to you about what kind of diet I do too. And it's, it's just like you said, I mean, I, you know, I'm primarily a, I'm, I'm a personal trainer, you know, I work with people on their general, my general fitness clients, it's, it's, it's health, you know, fitness, you know, just, just general training. And then my athletes, you know, it's performance based. I don't even talk about nutrition until they bring it up, you know, and then I gave them, I give them some just generalized guidelines I'll steer them in the right direction if I can't help them, you know, and if people do want to talk about plant-based nutrition, I'm all about it. And actually, you know, I, I, I thank you for this, but I've gotten a lot of people uh, over the years, you know, that you've referred to me that reach out to you asking about plant-based diet. And, uh, you know, then, then it's no problem because when the interest is there, you just give them the information and, and uh, they, they do with it what they will. But Yeah, trying to get people to do stuff they don't want to do is just going to be a total battle of attrition. I mean, imagine if you tried to get clients by just walking up to people on the street saying, hey, I'm a personal trainer and here's my gym and I'd love to work with you. You have no idea whether this person has any interest whatsoever. It would be like me taking some brochures for my testosterone booster. I don't have any brochures, but let's say I did. And I take a stack of brochures and I go to Town Square here in Vegas and I just start handing them out. Every time someone walks by, hey, man, this is a natural testosterone booster I built. Just wanted to pass it on to you in case you're interested. I mean, you could probably pass out 10,000 of those brochures. You'll be lucky if you get one call. And, you'll be, and even more lucky if you actually make one sale from that. 
Now contrast that with you write an article about the benefits of boosting your own testosterone. You talk about how to do it with your diet, your sleep, your restoration. And then you throw in also, if you want to take supplements, here's some things that work. People, and then people who are actually looking for that information come across that article, you're way more inclined for that person to take whatever you're offering seriously. So totally. it's a 100%. approach. I, th I think building any business, you have to have a long run approach. And you also have to have the notion that well, one of the biggest impediments to success, I think, is this attitude that nothing works. So you tell someone, hey, here's a really good program. Yeah, but I don't think that's going to work for me. It's like, hey, how do I get started in the business? Well, start doing some free sessions. Go volunteer to work with firefighters. Go to, go to your local, go find youth that are in danger of getting into a criminal lifestyle and offer your services to them, you know, just to get the wall, just to get the wheel moving here. It's like, nah, that's not going to work. So whenever, whenever you're dealing with that, yeah, but mentality, you know, this, this is in, even if it's in your own head, it's a total impediment to any level of success. And I remember when I first started in the business, one of the things I did is I wanted to, I wanted to network with certain people, but there was no reason why they would want to network with me because I'm just getting started. I don't have anything going on. So what I did is I just started interviewing people. I contacted people and said, hey, I'd love to interview for you for a publication. Frank Shamrock, Charles Poliquin, let's see, Carlin Kolker, Richard Makowitz, author of Unleash the Warrior Within. I just contacted these people and people were like, man, I, I can't believe any of those people responded. I go, see, that's the mentality that stops people yep. from doing anything. You're, it's self-rejection is where I'm going. Yep. You go, hey, I'd love to interview Frank Shamrock. Yeah, but why would he want to work with me? Nah, eh, I guess I'm just not going to bother. When who cares if you get rejected by email? You send a couple emails out and you don't get a response. <laughs> Big deal. Or even if you do get a response saying I'm not interested, so what? You know, it's not. It's, yeah. it's, it's but but people they they just talk themselves out of things more than anything else. So you're your own worst enemy. Totally, man. It's you, you see it all the time. I mean, I remember. I'll get trainers that contact me about, hey, can I come work at your training center? You know, are you hiring? Blah, blah, blah. And I had this one guy contact me a few years ago where he had just, just graduated from one of those like weekend personal training institutes or three months. I, I don't know. But <laughs> point being, he was very, very young and very green, you know, and he came to me. And, and uh, so I, I sat down, I was talking to him, I was explaining that I would be willing to do some sort of contract deal with him, but I don't have employees, you know? And yeah. I said, well, what's your goal? He said, well, what I want to do is I want to really build up some clientele and get some experience. Then I want to move to New Jersey to be with my girl and, you know, take my business up there. I said, well, you're in Atlanta, your clients, are, you're, you're going to, you're going to waste six months trying to build up clientele down here. And maybe, maybe you have a decent number by that. I don't know, but, but why don't you, if you want to be in New Jersey, why don't you just move up to Jersey, be with your girl now. And then I said, you, you might not know anybody up there, but here's what you do. I said, find some gyms, find some training centers in your area that you're going to be living that do a type of training you're interested in, or there's trainers there that, that are they're working with a demographic you want to work with and then go volunteer. You know, maybe they got, maybe they're hiring for, for maybe somebody to clean up, you know, some bathrooms or maybe right. a front desk person, get in the door, start, and then start offering to shadow people, start offering to help the trainers. And his reply to me was, I just graduated from da da da, you know, personal training university. I'm above folding towels. I was like, motherfucker, I've yeah. been doing this for almost 20 years and I fold my own towels and I just clean my own shitters. Nobody is above folding towels, you know, and right then and there, I just knew this guy wasn't, I don't know whatever happened to him, but you just, those, those people, they're, they're not, they're not long for the business, man. It's an entitled mentality. It's an entitled mentality of I paid for this certification. So now I should just get clients by snapping my fingers. Yeah. Yeah. And or, or the best is when they contact uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'll let you contract out of my training. Center. Great. How many leads are you going to generate for me a month? I'm like, okay, one, stop fucking listening to Gary Vaynerchuk all day on YouTube and actually go out and do something. How many, if I'm going to do the work to generate leads, I'm going to take that business asshole. You know, it's right, like, right. God, why would you generate all this business for someone else? Yeah. Like, yeah. It's, it's more at your own facility, no less. Yeah. No, it, it's totally moronic. And the, what you said about how you clean your own bathrooms and you still fold towels. Well, Jamie Josta, hey, Breed, he talks about on his podcast how he still hands out flyers at his shows and so, or, or at, to promote his shows. And he's at a pretty high level, especially for a hardcore band. He's probably the biggest yeah. hardcore band out there. And he travels the world playing at festivals and so forth. And still, he still is willing to do those basic moves that got him to yeah. where he was in the first place. 
you, you never outgrow the basics. Nope. Is what's going never. on. So, and also, you don't want to become so entitled that you think certain things are beneath you as well. I mean, when I first started my kettlebell training business, I was in Virginia at the time, Northern Virginia, where I grew up. And I go, man, I, I have I have experience doing public speaking, so I'm comfortable in front of a room. That's not an issue. But I don't have really a lot of experience training people. So I just volunteered to work with some volunteer firefighters locally. And I just taught them what I knew at the time because I was just developing my kettlebell skills as well. But that was really empowering on multiple levels. One, they had a really good time. Two, I was like, I felt really comfortable doing it. So that gave me more confidence to eventually start charging people and start promoting my own workshops. But it was that it was basically my own self-made internship because I did it for about six weeks, about three times a week, six weeks. And after that, I go, OK, I'm, I'm not bad at this. So let me just start moving on here and I can start building my business now. And then I coincidentally, I got laid off from the last job I ever had during that self-made internship so i just supercharged in that direction of doing my own courses that, this, probably one of the best things that ever happened to you oh it's, it's by far the best thing that ever happened to me because i was comfortable like a lot of people are yeah. i didn't enjoy the job at all i had no passion for it a lot of yeah. times i'd be driving to work going what is my existence even about and what's the point of all this i go if i got into a car accident right now i wouldn't even care because it's, there was just no pleasure out of any of it and you're making decent money, so that's the trap. Right. That's the trap of, well, I've got this security right now, so let me just save a little bit more. And there's never going to be enough. You're always going to say, let me just save a little bit more. Sure. Let me take one more job. Let me just let me try to build whatever else I want to do on the side. And then when, this, is, this is the biggest one that stops people. They go, okay, let's say I make $5,000 a month at my job. So I'm going to start building up this fitness business on the side. And when that side income matches my primary income, then I'll switch over. It's never yeah. going to happen. Now, that side income is never going to match your primary income unless you make it your primary yeah. income, which means you got to go full. You got to go balls deep into that opportunity. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, you can't have this half ass mentality of let me just put my foot in the water and test the waters here and then I'll jump in when I'm ready. No, that's a great point, man. I mean, it's 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 kind of how it was starting my business. The only good thing was was my regular job was in the fitness industry, so I was already doing what I wanted to do. I just wasn't doing it for myself. But to your point, it was very cozy and probably better, you know, in in my department because I didn't mind doing what I was doing. You know, I was still working with people. I just wasn't doing it for myself. You know, and I had a good gig where I was at, so it was very easy to coast. You know, I'm at that training center from you know, six in the morning till three in the afternoon, training people over there. Then I'm at my own gym at night. You know, this isn't, this isn't a bad thing. I'm in the gym all day. I'm training people all day. The income was great. But finally, when it was, it, 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 it was like, it's time to shit or get off the pot. Right. And when I went into my own thing and you lose that huge income, man, that was scary. But again, the best thing I ever did, because, you know, now I've been doing my own thing ever since, you know, I, I mean, I, I started my business in 04, but solely my business since 2011, and, you know, it's one of those things I should have done it sooner. You know, hindsight's always twenty twenty, right. but, but it, it was, uh, it was easy to get stuck in that trap, especially when you got a job where you got retirement, you're getting free money on your retirement. You know, I, I had a good fitness industry gig, but it wasn't what I wanted to do. And I couldn't, you know, I didn't see myself doing it forever. So it was just time to get out and do my own thing. At, this was, well, what kind of job was this? You were at it a, was, uh, it was for a private uh, country club uh, here in Atlanta. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So it, it was great because it was a small staff, you know, you had exclusive, uh, exclusive members, you know, everybody, you know, made good money. So it was nothing for them to, to pay for personal training. We had good salary. We had benefits. I mean, it was a job that just doesn't exist in the fitness industry. And right. I just really lucked into it when I moved to Atlanta, but you know, it, it did allow me to, to branch off, do my own thing and eventually set me up for where I wanted to be. I just, I just, I, I wrote it out too long, man. You know, it was just easy to keep doing it. Yeah, it, it is easy to do that. And I, I fell into a similar trap. I just kept doing these jobs that I knew I had no passion for for way too long. Because the thing about me is I'm only good at what I'm excited about. I'm only good at what I'm passionate about. And I learned this lesson really early, but I, I, it just didn't set in in a substantial way because I wasn't a good student in high school. I barely made it to college. When I when I got accepted by two colleges, I was like, whew, you know, I actually got in somewhere. <laughs> you know? Thank God. So I went to the College of Wooster and I probably had one of the lower G high school GPAs and my SAT scores weren't great either. But one thing, what, what happened though when I got into college is first year I wasn't really that interested in what I took and it showed, I was just passing. But the yeah. second year I actually transferred to Lewis and Clark College in Oregon. 
And I met a guy who had a very strong influence on me, a guy named Art Bueller. He's a religious studies professor. In particular, he specializes in mysticism, Sufism, Buddhism, Hinduism. And I'm half Indian. I grew up with Hinduism, yeah. grew up with Hindu mythology. My mother would give me these Hindu comics. Other people are reading Superman comics. I'm reading Mahabharata comics and <laughs> Bhagavad Gita comics. So I'm learning about all these Indian gods who are like superheroes. So I had an interest in that. So I took one course with him. I go, okay, this is really interesting. Let me take a few more. I took maybe three more courses with him while I was out there. And then finally I got to Sufism and I got super interested in that, Islamic mysticism. Now what's interesting is this guy was only at Lewis and Clark College for the very year that I was there. I ended up going back to Wooster afterwards where I started. So if I didn't transfer there at that year, I never would have met this guy and yeah. I, wouldn't have majored in religious studies because I majored in religious studies because I met him and I was so interested in what he was talking about. You know, when you were really interested in something, I would do all the coursework and then I would do additional research just for my own benefit. So I'd yeah. be sitting around late at night just reading these books, not for extra credit in the course, just because I was like, wow, this is really interesting. Let me go down this rabbit hole a little bit further. And then I became a really good student. I was on the dean's list. I didn't, I didn't care about getting straight A's. It was just a side effect of actually doing something I liked. So I really liked religious studies and I liked sociology as well. So those were the two topics. If I, if I were gonna do another major, it might've been sociology or a minor or something like that. So when I, was, when I took courses I enjoyed, I excelled. When I took courses where let's say it was a requirement, you just had to dial it in, I would just do the minimum effort yeah. to pass that course. I was the same way. Yeah. So this is the lesson I learned at in at an early age. This is my early twenties. I go, hey, it's you know, it's not that you're dumb. It's not that you're not a good student. It's just that your, your your brain just shuts off when it's something you're not interested in. And when it's something you're really interested in, boom, things fire up. So even way back then, I had a really strong interest in strength training and fitness. I've been working out since I was eighteen. So I'd. I didn't have any inclination to get in, into, into it professionally at that time, but it was something I really enjoyed doing. And it was something I enjoyed talking about. And people around me would often say, they're like, man, you should be in the industry. You know so much about this. You're so enthusiastic about it. But then you start getting bad advice from well-intentioned people around you. They're like, oh, you're not going to make any money doing that. Everything's yeah. always about how much money you're going to make. It's never yeah. about, no one ever asks you, if you tell someone, hey, I got a job, I'm making $150,000, they're gonna be like, wow, that's great. They're not gonna ask you, do you like what you're doing? Are no. you enjoying it? Are you happy? Because they're assuming that all those things are falling in line because of the income you're making, and that's just not the case. Maybe initially you're like, wow, this is great, especially if you've never made good money before and you land a job like that, you're like, wow, this is great, I'm gonna pay off all the credit card debts, I'm gonna start saving and so forth. And that high will last for maybe six months to a year, but then after a while, you're going to go, you know what, this job is, there's no gratification whatsoever here. I'm not getting any gratification. And that's really important. It's important to have gratification from whatever you do. It's important for your people to tell you, Scott, you've made a big difference in my life. I love coming here. I like working out with you. It's important for me to get emails from people saying, I love your products, or I read your book, or I attended one of your courses a while back, and here's the impact it had. It's important to have that, that, that kind of feedback. We all need it. It's not enough just to just to make an income and hate what you're doing. I think one of the, one of the one of the greatest things that that we can do is be in service of others and I think that's probably why people like you and me gravitate toward the industry that we're in because we do get to help others, you know? And I mean, it, it's definitely, you know, I, I don't I don't like when people say, "Well, it's not about the money." Well, it is. I mean, we've got to make an income. Yeah. But yeah. it feels good to be able to have these tangible services or products that help people become healthier, helps them with their performance goals. And that's very fulfilling. You know, it goes right. above and beyond the actual work because you're making a difference in someone's life. And that's pretty cool. You know, I mean, that, that's why, you know, I don't really care about my own personal achievements in, in strength training, martial arts. That's why I don't compete, you know, really in anything that I do anymore because right. it's not about me. You know, I do that stuff for myself, for my own self-betterment. But really what I love is to help a competitor get better, help somebody who's just interested in health and fitness become healthy and more fit. I, I love that. I mean, it, it, and I think that's what that's why you see a lot of great people who gravitate toward coaching and stuff like that. They weren't always the best. 
in their chosen sport. You know, I mean, I, I've always heard stories about like, uh, you know, like Freddie Roach, you know, he, he was, he was a good boxer. He wasn't a great boxer, but he's, you know, arguably one of the greatest coaches on the planet. Right. right. You know, and some people just, they, they, they fall into those roles a little bit better, you know, and, and some of the best competitors make the worst coaches because yeah. a competitor has to be, they've got to be selfish. They've got to be focused by, if they want to be the best, it's not about helping others. It's about, cutting all that crap out and focusing on themselves. So it's just, you know, coming from a different perspective, but right. I think people like you and myself and some of our friends that we're close with, uh, we really enjoy making a difference in people's lives. And that's very, that's very rewarding. Yeah, no, absolutely. One thing I wanted to rewind to is when you were talking about when you started your own thing, it was, there was a lot of fear that came with that. Yeah. And I, okay. I hear that from a lot of people, any entrepreneur, whatever the business is, but one thing I always tell them, I go, that fear is your best friend. That fear is a good thing because that fear is what's going to get you up in the morning and go. Because when I first started my business and I moved to Santa Monica in 2002, every morning I woke up going, you need to make something happen today to push your business forward. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's getting a new online client, or a personal training client, promoting a workshop, writing an article for publication, something. Every day you have to have some tangible mark you're making. You can't just dick around. You can't just hope things are going to come to you. And so you had that that adrenaline going at all times. And that, that's a necessity when you're starting a business. When someone has this lax attitude of, yeah, you know, I'm going to try it out, see how it goes. And then many people I knew who, who got certified as kettlebell instructors around the same time I did, many of them would give themselves these deadlines. They'd go, okay, you know, if I'm not making this by this time frame, that I'm going to move on to something else. And I go, just move on to whatever that is now, because you're not going to make that by that time frame. And if that's such a strong requirement for you, but when I first got into the business, my goal, I didn't have necessarily income goals. My goal was to stay above water long enough to last. Yeah. I wanted to, I wanted to build a, I wanted to survive because the most important thing for an entrepreneur, when you start a business is you make it out of that first year because most businesses don't. Don't worry about having this great income. Like, oh, I want to make six figures by year three. It's always this generic response. You always hear that from people. Yeah, I want to make six figures by year three. Okay, you haven't even made a dollar yet. You're talking about yeah. making six figures? Why don't you make your first hundred bucks now? Yeah. <laughs> then yeah. we'll build it out from there. It'd be like yeah. me taking someone, it's like, okay, I'm going to teach you this system for playing blackjack. Like, okay, well, how much money are we going to make? It's like learn the system first, buddy. All right, you know, exactly. start at the three dollar table. Maybe make ten bucks the first time you try. You know? and, and then that's such, uh, that, that's such <laughs> the bullshit about our industry too. Is you, you remember all those people that were selling the 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 make money in the fitness industry systems? Okay. You know, I the, the reason I never gave any of those guys a dime was. Because they had no track record themselves. It's like, wait a second, you're going to tell me how to how to be the six figure trainer or the seven figure trainer? You know, yeah, you're, you're posing standing in front of a, a Lamborghini or Ferrari that you probably went and rented for the day. Right. You cashed out some money in your bank account. You're holding that. You know, as a bunch of ones wrapped up in a hundred. I mean, it, I, I could see through that bullshit because. They never talked about how many people they trained. They never talked about how many clients they themselves generated. It, it was always buy my system, guaranteed. So they're making money selling right. a system that you hope you're going to make money on. I mean, it's the biggest crock of shit, you know, but people just buy in. And the fitness industry is just yeah. so it, it's just uh, it's just rampant in the fitness. And it drives me nuts, man, because there's a couple of reasons why that happens. Number one is the kind of the people you're talking about. Those are people who never made six figures as a trainer. They're making six figures now selling you information on how to make six figures as a trainer. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the niche they fell into. They they realized at some point going, hey, I'm, maybe I'm not that great of a trainer or maybe I don't have much passion for it. But I noticed, but I do know a couple of things about business marketing. So I'm just going to package that even though I, I don't know whether it's effective or not. It sounds good. So I'm just going to package that. Because a lot of trainers don't understand promotion. They don't understand business development. They don't understand marketing. So they Absolutely. see they see a niche market. And I've traveled all over the world teaching courses and I've talked to trainers everywhere. And if, one of the one of the common messages I heard from a lot of trainers is they're not looking to learn more new skill sets, more weapons to add to their arsenal. What they really want to learn is how to get more people in the door, how to make more money. So yeah. there's a desperate need 
And then there's people that are opportunists that are going to take advantage of that desperate need. And if you don't do your due diligence and look into backgrounds and so forth going, okay, this person said they did this. Well, where's the proof of any of that actually happening? But you're right. That, that's a racket that a lot of people realize they could capitalize on. I actually made a, a, an eight-hour course on how to make six figures in the fitness business. But this was 2012. I've been a trainer for 12 10 years at that point. And I, and I had a track record of making six figures yep. and it was more, here's what I did and here's why it worked rather than yep. this is what's going to work for you. Because what I did to promote workshops early in my career, that's not really going to work now because the landscape has changed radically. When I first started, nobody was teaching kettlebell workshops. I had a monopoly on it. Nobody was doing it. Nobody thought you could make money teaching people how to train with kettlebells, when I would tell people, yeah, I'm getting in the fitness industry and I'm gonna focus on being a kettlebell instructor, I'm gonna do other things, but that's gonna be my primary thing. They're like, they're like no one, no, no one's gonna, you're not gonna make any money doing that. It's probably 50 people who even own kettlebells in the country at that point. But to me, that was an opportunity. It was a ground floor right. opportunity because I loved training with kettlebells. So it started there. I go, man, this is an awesome training system. I bet a lot of other people would enjoy this too if they're exposed to it. And the only options then were you go take Pavel's certification in Minneapolis, and at that time it was once a year, then it became twice a year, and then so forth. But that was the only option for any kind of professional instruction. And so, I think Steve Maxwell went to the first course, and I think he started doing some classes at Maxercise, his gym in Philadelphia at the time. But he wasn't traveling teaching courses at all. He wasn't, he wasn't doing any of that at that point. So the options were, okay, if you happen to be in Philadelphia, you can stop by Steve's gym, learn a couple things from him. Or maybe if you're a couple hours away, you can make an appointment or you can take Pavel's course. And then, then I came into the game and I'm traveling the country teaching courses. And once people saw that I'm willing to travel, more opportunities came too. They go, okay, he lives in Los Angeles, but he just drove to Arizona. Let me contact him. Maybe he'll come to our gym in Texas or he'll come to our gym in Ohio. And I didn't turn down any opportunity. <laughs> like anyone yeah. who wanted to teach anywhere at that time, because it wasn't even so much about the money. It was about improving my teaching ability. I go, because every time I teach a course, I'm getting better at this. So the more courses I teach, the money will come later. Get really good at the skill set of teaching, and then the money will come. And then I, I, even, I remember I had, I had eight people at the first course I ever taught in Northern Virginia. I tried, it was a two-hour course because I was only teaching what I knew at the time, which was about two hours of material. And then I think each person paid maybe $65. And I was so happy that I was doing something that I enjoyed and people were actually willing to pay for it. I had a big high off that 480 bucks I made. I go, man, this is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I met a bunch of, and, and that's not a bad payday anyway. In two hours, no, it's not. 400, I mean, even now that would be pretty good. Yeah. I was really, so that, that, I think having some kind of early success is really important too. When you get into something and let's say it takes a year for some kind of barometer that you're on the right track, that can be discouraging. But if you get in and you get a couple positive reactions to whatever you're trying to do, such as me contacting, contacting Frank Shamrock and him saying, yeah, sure, I'll do that interview. That's one. You know, me doing a kettlebell course and people actually show up. You know, you, I could have done that course and nobody signed up. And I'm going, OK, you know, maybe there isn't an opportunity here or maybe one person signs up, which is better than zero. It's still worth doing at one when you're getting started. But the attitude I have with the attitude I've seen with a lot of people who came into the game a few years after me is they're going, you know, I tried doing a workshop, but only three people signed up. So I canceled. I go, why did you cancel? That, that's your first workshop. You got to start somewhere. Or they're really discouraged that only three people hand, came in. I go, look, you don't have the skill set to handle 30 people right now. Even if they did show up, that would be the worst thing that could ever happen to you. Yep. It takes a lot of competence to handle a big group of people on your own. That's, that's something you want to game. to you. If you, yeah. if you have 30 people sign up at your first course, that's going to be a disaster because you're not going to yeah. know what the, it's going to be chaos. You know, yeah. A workshop is chaos. It's like triage where you're, you're trying to train 30 people at the same time. And then you have to work the room and give quick tips. Here's like, okay, here, you need to work on this. You, you need to get the bell over here. You, you need to get your hand around. So it's not slapping your wrist, right? You need to make quick statements like that because you can't just spend 30 minutes with one person. Helping nope. them when 29 other people are standing around going, okay, when are you going to get to me? So you have yep. to be boom. So it's a different skill set than being a one-on-one -on -one personal trainer is where I'm going. And the, the worst thing that could happen to you is if you get a lot of people at your first course and you have no experience because they're probably going to have a negative experience. They're going to go, man, this guy sucks. You know, we yep. took this course. This guy had no confidence and the, 
every time he was talking, people would just be chit chatting among themselves, you know, <laughs> like a comedian who no one respects, like the, a comedian gets on stage and no one's laughing. So you just start talking to the person next to you. And now the audience is getting louder and louder and louder. It, it's, it's, I'm, I'm really glad I didn't have big numbers until well yeah. into my career. By the time I did have big numbers, I could handle it. It was cool. And I enjoyed it. It was, it was a rush well, to have. You start career. out with those small numbers. Think about, you know, if you're doing a two hour workshop and you only got three people there, I mean, that's almost like personal training and yeah. they're going to get a lot of attention and they're going to get a very high quality of service. And 100%. if they only paid 50 bucks or, you know, you know, whatever for man, they're going to go, wow, I really got more than my money's worth. And you're going to have three amazing testimonials and feedback. And then that's going to roll to the next one and the next one and the next one. And you're going to have this great track record. And like you said, one, you're building your ability to work with larger groups of people as your seminars grow, but it's doing so in a way where you're building a good reputation for your quality of service. So now you're going to have this, this kind of precedence that you set and you're, you're, you're going to have this, this kind of a, a testimonial behind you that people are going to be, be able to see before they sign up to your workshop. And that's just going to grow. Whereas right. start out with a big group of people and yeah, don't, don't, don't go to that. He sucks. I didn't learn anything, man. <laughs> I, I paid 50 bucks and he did, he, you know, yeah, I, I didn't even learn how to clean a kettlebell when I walked away from that, you know, because he was scatterbrained. He, he couldn't handle the room. And, you know, it, it's you got to grow slow and steady. And pretty soon, you know, you're doing it 12 years, 15 years, 20 years, you know, and you're looking back on it saying that was definitely the way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's better that it happens that way because it can be yeah. really overwhelming if it goes the other way. And it's interesting because when I was involved with Dragon Door, I was involved with Dragon Door from 2002 to 2006. And that, that was a really important part of my career because it, it allowed it, it basically supercharged my progress because I was able to I mean, they leveraged me as well as me leveraging them. So it was mutual. So when I left, people always thought like, oh, yeah, you know, he wasn't happy with what he's getting paid. I was like, no, that, that wasn't it at all. And first of all, no one was getting paid. None of us were employees. We're all independent right. contractors. I mean, we didn't even get when I when I first started assisting at the early certifications, I didn't get paid at all. And then they started paying a little bit and then it started going up from there. But I didn't care about that. I didn't expect to get paid there. I just wanted to do it for the experience and then to meet other instructors and so forth. I wasn't concerned about going out there and making money. It's just more opportunities for me to improve my craft. But a lot of people in that organization complained incessantly about how Dragon Door is not doing enough for their business. And I go, well, what exactly do you expect them to do for you? They're just going to knock on your door and just like you said, they're just going to give you leads every single yeah. day. You're not putting yourself out there in any way. And what are you even asking for? You're complaining about how they're not doing anything for you. But have you ever have you ever voiced these concerns to anyone that, that matters? It's like you're telling me I'm not a decision maker in Dragon Door. I mean, some of the advice I, I worked at a gym as a selling memberships for a while and my boss at the time gave great advice. He goes, whenever you're dealing with any kind of customer service issue, find someone who gets paid enough to care. So these, these people are complaining about what they're not getting. They're, they're complaining to me where I don't have any power to do anything. I go, talk to John and Pavel if you want to voice your concerns. Let them know. And then let's see, yeah. start a conversation and go from there. But my attitude was a little bit different. I noticed I would just look for clever opportunities to leverage things in my favor. So for, for example, at the time, drag, on the Dragon Door website, Pavel's workshops would be listed in a, in a prominent area on the website, meaning it was really easy to find. So it would be all of Pavel's workshops listed. So I contacted John and Pavel and I go, hey, I'm one of your senior RKCs. Is it, would, you, would you mind listing my workshops there as well? And they're like, yeah, sure. Well, guess what happened? A lot of people signed up at courses because what happens when you go to that workshop button? You see Pavel's courses and you see my courses. So you start going, okay, this Mike Mahler guy must be a high level coach because he's the only, he's the only certified instructor on the same page that Pavel's courses are at. Yeah. So that's an example of what I'm talking about. They sold my videos. I sold more of my uh, copies of my videos than they did. But one thing I did do to get more promotion is they used to send out that heart style catalog. Yeah. Of our Vitalics. And then, uh, then I think there was two separate catalogs. But anyway, Pavel's videos were always front and center for obvious reasons. That's the that's their number one seller. That's their sure. that's their content creator. That's the guy who started this whole thing. So it's, it makes sense that he's front and center. So some of the other guys selling videos would be like, oh, you know, we're in the back of the catalog, and you know, Pavel's always in the front. And I go, well, I talked to John and I said, why don't you take instead of doing a 50-50 split on the videos, why don't you take seventy percent? 
or I might have even said 80 percent and I get 20 or 30 percent. So you're incentivized now to give me more exposure in the magazine. He's like, yeah, I'll do that. So then, then all of a sudden, I think I had a front cover promotion and then several pages inside the magazine in the middle, not in the very back. So that's just an example of what, what are you trying to get out of this thing instead of just complaining about it to people that you don't know. And what's interesting is years after I left Dragon Door, I taught a course in, where did I teach a course? Somewhere in California. And I had some RKCs meet up with us afterwards for the group dinner. And what were they doing? <laughs> they were still complaining about what's going on in Dragon Door. Now, these are people who may have just got involved there uh, as I was exiting. But yeah. It, the point is, is that there's no point complaining if you're not complaining to someone who can do something about it. What's the point? Exactly. But I think they got some pleasure out of like, you know, F this and F that. And they're, they're, they have some camaraderie now among this complaining, which is why I think people, a lot of people complain. People find joy in sitting around and complaining. You know, I mean, some people, they need that. They need to sit around and be bitter. And as long as they got three or four other people, they can all sit around in a bitter little group. Yeah. I mean, whatever. I mean, if that... It, it, you know, if that floats your boat, but there's there's nothing constructive out of that. It doesn't do anything, you know, positive for you. But some people, they just like that. They they just like to jump on that and complain about shit, man. And that's the other reason why a lot of people don't become successful. Number one is your own negative self talk. Number two is your sphere of influence. And a lot of times yeah. it's negative sphere of influence. Yep. A lot of times it's like, hey, I'm going to try doing this, and people are like, that's not going to work. Why even bother doing that? Now, people like that, you just want to excommunicate. It's like time to yeah. get lost, man. I don't need that kind of negativity. You want to give me some constructive feedback? Cool. But don't tell me what yeah. I'm capable of doing or not doing. You know, that, that, that game I'm not going to play. But a lot of times, if you have people in your life who don't want to see you grow to your full potential, those are people you need to get rid of because they're not doing you any good whatsoever. Maybe there's some jealousy on their part saying, oh, this person actually has the courage to pursue his or her bliss, and I don't. So I'm going to try to, I'm going to, try to sabotage what they're doing. Yeah, and, but that's that's that person needs to see a therapist. You know, they need to yep. get some mental. <laughs> it's because when you don't want the best for others, what does that say about you? You know, when you enjoy seeing people fail, or you or, or other people are trying to strive, and sometimes even trainers are really negative. They see someone working out, like, oh, look at this fat ass over here trying to do this. I was like, hey, they're trying to do something, man. Why don't you go over there and help them out instead of sitting there yep. denigrating them, or just don't say anything. But they're making the effort. And your job, you yeah, got yeah. into this business to help people, I'm assuming. And if, you, yep. if that's not the reason why you got in, then you should get out of it. Because if you just got in it to make money, it's the wrong business to get into just to make money. Go be an investment yeah. banker or, a bank or some kind of finance person, a financial advisor. <laughs> Go do something like that where it's all about making money. Not, not a, you can make a great income in the fitness industry, but that, that shouldn't be the, the entry, the, the reason why you enter, the reason why you get into the whole thing. Yeah, it's 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 hard to it's hard to make a lot of money in the fitness industry without putting the time in and building. And it's getting harder and harder because it's so much more competitive. And yeah. unfortunately, what's making it competitive is these like Instagram famous like superstars who really right. don't train people. They just have a nice physique or they got a big ass or whatever. And they start posting these selfies and they start putting out, you know, content, you know, that they call it, you know motivational quotes or whatever. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous what's out there, but yeah. you know, it works for some of those people, but it does make it, uh, it does make it competitive. You know, if you're trying to create a tangible service and that's the other thing too. I mean, I, I get the appeal to working with people online and stuff and I do a little bit of that, but yeah. it's like, I've got a, I've got a brick and mortar center. I need to focus my efforts in here, not on somebody in Europe or something like that. Now, if somebody contacts me and they want some help, absolutely. But I need to focus my efforts on helping my people I got coming in here. You know, I've got to get these people results. That's where I got to focus. That's why I don't get these people that ho have training centers or gyms. And I see them like all fucking day they're posting online. It's like, where do you people have the time to do this shit? You know, I mean, I, I barely have time to make an Instagram post a day, you know, about what we're doing in here, you know, because I've just got so much shit going on trying to help people in here. So I, I don't I don't get it, man. Yeah, I don't get it either. I mean, Mark Phillip, he's like you too. He runs a really cool facility here in Vegas. And the only thing he posts are his workouts at midnight often because that's the only time he can get it in. He's doing those heavy yeah. deadlift work, those heavy deadlift posts he puts up. A lot of times that's at in the middle of the night because he's busy training people all day long. Yeah. But yeah, so he doesn't, he needs someone else basically to take a bunch of photos and be that documentarian type person 
that can document everything he's doing with his business because he's busy actually training people. And that that's that's the catch-22 with a lot of trainers that I see, though. And, and I don't see this in a negative sense. But a lot of the trainers I know who are really good, they're not that well-known because they're so busy working on the craft of training people. They're actually trainers. All yeah. day long, clients, 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 clients. And when they get home, they're not going to go home and write a bunch of articles. They're beat. You got to go yeah. sleep for a couple hours and then do it again the next day. So they're they're exceptional trainers. You talk to them, you're like, wow, this person really knows what he or she is talking about. But a lot of people don't know who they are because they don't have the time to do a lot of the necessary promotional things. Yeah. So that that can be a challenge. But I think you made a point a while back where you said, don't worry about writing a bunch of articles early in your career. Just put in work training people because if you're a trainer for 10 years, consistently training people, you're going to have so much to write about. Yep. That you'll have so you'll have the next hundred topics and then some ready to go whenever you want to. And it'll be real. You won't be speculating like we were talking about early on, like, hey, here's this cool workout I conceptualized. Well, I've been using these methods for 10 years. Now I can tell you who succeeded with it, who failed with it, where we had to tweak things. Now you have some actual legitimate content that that's beneficial, but it's honest, you know? Right. Right. Exactly. Now let's talk about the, the plan based thing a little bit, because when, when did you, when did this start becoming appealing to you? Was this something that you thought about for a long time before you jumped into it? Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, for me, Mike, it, it was, uh, you know, like we talked earlier, it definitely stemmed out of more animal, uh, welfare, uh, minded. And when I was getting it, I, I certainly got in much later uh, than you had. But even when I was getting in, it wasn't like it is nowadays where there's so much focus on vegan and plant based and all these companies are jumping on board, which is great uh, right. because it's, it's, it's an easier gateway uh, to get into eating plant based. But for me, it was about animal. It was about animal welfare. I started thinking about actually the, the, the thing that really tipped me about it was my wife, Lisa, and I are both really into uh, we were both into animal rescue, ad adopting animals, volunteering for organizations, donating money. And we were at the beach in North Carolina uh, one Memorial Day weekend. And we were sitting at this restaurant on the beach. And I think I had like this disgusting. It was like this barbecue <laughs> trifecta of like like chicken and, and, and steak and ribs and a side of crab legs. And I'm sitting there, I got barbecue sauce all over my face. My wife's sitting there looking across the table at me just with complete disgust. And she said, she said, and now granted she had a piece of fish sitting in front of her, but I said, have you ever thought about where your food comes from? And yeah. I immediately, it hit me and I got pissed. Um, I was really angry, you know, and I'm like, really, you're going to start, you know, getting on your high horse while you're sitting there and you eat meat and you eat, and and it and and I shouldn't have gotten mad because it was a change that she was wanting to make. It was a change right. that she had been questioning. But but this is why approaching people with this stuff doesn't always work because they get defensive. Exactly. And and I did. I'm like, you know nothing about building muscle and getting jacked and blah 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 and strength right. this and fitness this and all that. And then but that 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 planted the seed, you know. And it slowly over time started to started to grow, and. I started thinking about it and I'm like, well, yeah, there, there's that Mike guy, you know, the kettlebell guy. I know he's, he's vegan, but I don't really know anybody else. I don't really know any, you know, Bill Pearl I heard was vegetarian. Yeah. Uh, so I started thinking about it and then finally, you know, I had enough in my mind. The, the, the final straw for me was, uh, for the longest time in our house, we were using our garage for storage, not for actually parking in it. So we had a bunch of shelves and just, just crap out there. And the only time I would open the garage door would be to take trash out every week. And <laughs> one day I start noticing my garage stinks, you know, smelling really bad. And there's so much shit in there. I don't know what it is. And one day I moved something and I saw the carcass, a maggot covered rabbit. And mm. I realized what had happened. I had the garage door open one day, it came in. And I shut the door and he stayed in there and he was trapped and he died, you know, oh, yeah. and, and, and it just, it, it hit me like a sledgehammer to the face. I'm like, I just not during, you know, not, not purposely, but I caused this animal to suffer and die. And then it was like, you know, the, 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 the clouds parted. I real I'm doing that with what I'm, you know, the choices I make with my food. And then it hit me in that minute. I said, that's it. I'm done eating meat. I don't know how I'm going to do this. I'm going to figure it out. And then, you know, I cut out eating meat and then eventually, you know, the eggs and the dairy and, and all that stuff. So I did transition over time. Yeah. Um, I stopped eating meat. Uh, I believe it was spring of 2010. 
And by and when I made the decision to go fully vegan, fully plant based, was uh, New Year's Eve 2012. Uh, because at that point, I was basically doing whey protein. I'm like, this is bullshit. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm just a poser. You know, I'm I'm talking about animals and I'm 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 drinking. You know, I'm I'm drinking. You know, dairy dairy whey. This is bullshit. You know, I need to just go totally all in. And I know people who flipped the switch and did it overnight. I think that's great. But I know some people, you know, they treat, you know, everybody comes to it when they're ready in their own way. And I think, you know, as, 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 uh, uh, people in the plant-based community and as vegans and stuff, you know, you need to be compassionate toward those people because they're trying to make it. Nothing drives me more crazy is when you see these elitist vegans who might, might've only been vegan for like fucking 10 minutes. And they're telling these people like, I don't know if I can give up cheese. I, I say, great, keep eating cheese, you know, cut out eggs and cut out meat and cut out all that stuff. You know, if that's going to get you getting more plants on your plate, then fucking right on. You know, right. then we can worry about the cheese later. You know, eventually you'll come to the point where you realize you don't need it. You're not addicted to it. It's a bunch of shit, yeah. you know. But you get these you get these these elitist, you know, vegans who, ah, oh, that's bullshit. You know, cheese is that, you know, it's like, come on, slow down, meet this person where they're at. You know, they're they're trying to make changes for the better. And you're going to turn them back to eating steak because you're being a fucking asshole, you know. Right. It doesn't have to be this binary choice of all or nothing. You can start with a gradual approach. And some people may even get to a point where they're not willing to go 100%, but they've reduced their meat consumption dramatically. Absolutely. Yeah. And it makes a big difference, too. So maybe they're going, yes. well, I'm going to have fish maybe twice a week, or I'm going to have eggs every once in a while. But most of the time, they're eating a plant-based diet. That's good too. And that if that's what works for that person, if that's if that's what allows that person to sustain that lifestyle indefinitely or for at least a long period of time, great. Because not everyone can I don't feel like what we do is rigid, but if if it feels rigid to someone, it is rigid to that person. So if exactly. if, they, if they feel like they're being deprived in some way, then it's a battle of attrition where your every battle of attrition ends the same way. You lose it at some point. 100%. Yeah, so I, I agree with that sentiment as well. And, and usually it's coming from someone who just who just bought in recently. And yeah. they, they may not even be doing it themselves in a couple of years. They may, you know, they, they may come We've to seen a, a lot of that, haven't we? Some of the yeah. biggest YouTube stars are now, you know, carnivore diet proponents. And, right, and what right. it shows you what their motivation for doing it is. They're just trying to bandwagon, you know. There was this one girl on Instagram. She was... What she was doing, actually, I thought was really interesting. She was doing a ketogenic vegan diet. So it was super remember, high Yeah, fat. you told me about her, yeah. yeah I'm to pass her information on to you. So anyway, she did. She was eating a lot of fat in her diet. And you can't do a pure ketogenic diet vegan, not easily anyway, but you can you can shift the macronutrients where it's more fat, less carbohydrates, and then a decent amount of protein. And what she was doing looked pretty interesting. And, and, it, was, and it seemed like it was working pretty well for her. And then she was supposed to speak on this ketogenic vegan diet at some event at some point, but by the bet between when the event was coming up and the time, the time period she had between now and when the event was coming up, she got involved with, she, she decided to switch over to that carnivore diet. Oh, and then she started posting about that. It was almost like a light switch went off. So the next day it's like, Oh yeah, I've been, now I'm just eating meat all the time and I feel great. And every day it was this, that, and so forth. And then people were going, Hey, aren't you speaking at this event? And you're going to be talking about, how to make a vegan, how to do a keto vegan diet. She's like, yeah, you know, it's going to be interesting. I was like, oh, yeah, it's going to be real right. interesting. What do you think those people are going to think when you show up and talk about, how, oh, yeah, I'm actually doing the carnivore diet now. It's like, well, I didn't sign up to come here and hear about that. So it's, it's just these people that are jumping on fads and so forth. And the, and the thing about the vegan diet also is that there's no one way to do it, meaning some people feel they go, well, look, I don't want to eat 80% carbohydrates, 10% protein, 10% fat, because I, I don't do well with a super high amount of carbohydrates. And then they go, well, if that's the only way to do it, then this is not going to work for me. Well, you don't have to do it that way. I like to have more fat in my diet as well. I'm not a ketogenic. I don't deprive myself of carbohydrates. I eat whatever I want. But I've always found that over the years that not super high fat, but just a decent amount makes me feel better. Like I feel stronger in the gym. My skin looks better. My yeah. hormones are better. You're into strength. You're into lifting. And, and, and lifters tend to do a little bit better on higher fat, you know, higher protein, lower carbohydrate. You know, a lot of times you look at what these endurance vegans are doing. Of course, they're going to have a higher amount of carbohydrate oh, yeah. in their diet. You know, so you can't you, you've also got to look at who's saying who's saying yeah. what and then what your goals are. You know, I mean, somebody brought up a good point. Look at, you know, if you want to be a, a vegan bodybuilder. 
look at bodybuilders or strong men or powerlifters who yeah. are omnivores. How do they eat? They eat a lot of protein and they eat a lot of fat. Well, right. you, you're going to have to find a way to get higher amounts of protein and higher fat in your vegan diet if those are your goal. You right. know, if your goal is health, well, then things change. You know, I mean, it, it depends on what your goals are. Right. And that, that, that determines, you know, the course your nutrition has got to take. Yeah, exactly. And you make a good point about the endurance athletes because what I've found is a lot of people who adopt a, like a whole food plant-based diet where it's heavier in carbohydrates. So let's say it's that 10-80-10 approach. They naturally gravitate towards endurance endeavors. All of a sudden, yeah. they're running a marathon. Ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. They're all, I mean, they may have never even thought about running a marathon, but now they have so much energy, they get into all these endurance sports and so forth because they're fueled yeah. up for that. And that's pretty cool. Yeah. And that, and that's great. So it's it's for in some ways it's actually easier for an endurance person to do a vegan diet because a, a, a whole food plant-based diet is going to be a lot more carbohydrates no matter what you do. Even if you're just eating a lot of nuts and seeds, there's still some carbohydrates in there and you can't just eat nuts and seeds and vegetables. You need more variety than that. So in some ways it, it caters to that really well organically without really even trying to do any mod without trying to modify it any way you're eating a lot of brown rice you're eating oatmeal you're eating quinoa etc these are all very high in carbohydrates good fuel sources for endurance yeah. as well so i can see how people all of a sudden they have so much energy now they're going for 10 mile hikes and they're way yeah. more active than they used to be and that's great but it can be modified like you said in the other direction as well it takes a little bit more practice it takes a little bit more figuring out how to put things together but it can definitely be done and also, I mean, there was a study on that eco, they call it eco Atkins, which is basically yes. a vegan version of an Atkins diet. And it's really more like the zone diet because it's about 40%, I think it's 40% fat, 30% protein, and then the rest from carbohydrates. So it's still a decent amount of carbohydrates. I wouldn't really call it a low carbohydrate diet. It's more balanced, which is actually a good thing. Yeah. But the health results from that were really positive as well. People's cholesterol levels came into a healthy range, their blood pressure improved, their insulin insulin sensitivity improved. So there wasn't any, there weren't any negatives, at least in the short run, of doing something like that. And then you don't really know what works for you until you do the lab work. So you could say, hey, I'm doing this and I feel great. Then you do the lab work. You're like, wow, that looks terrible. My glucose yeah. is through the roof and my blood pressure is increased and so forth. My blood pressure actually wasn't perfect until recently, because I had this horrible case of pneumonia. Actually, I've, I've always focused on, not, not always, but I tend to gravitate towards lifting heavier weights. I enjoy the, yeah. the powerlifting type stuff, even though I'm naturally more built for endurance. I think I have, like Mark Phillippe always made fun of me saying, you have fast, you have, you have fiber. He's like, he's like, yeah, you don't have a lot of fast twitch muscle fiber. You have more fiber types like women have, you know? They have a lot of endurance. You know, he said something like that, because I was someone where, like a, I would, I would max out on a certain weight, but I could take a pretty high percentage of that and then just bang yeah. out a lot of reps, right? So that's more that low, that slow twitch is where I'm trying to, what I'm trying to say, slow twitch muscle fiber take. So I gravitated on heavy weight training, eating a good amount of fat in my diet. Now, her, and, and my hereditary is my mom had high blood pressure. She actually died of a heart attack many years ago, 2015. So, and I have the same blood type as her, similar similar brain chemistry, et cetera. So I, I naturally had elevated blood pressure, not super high, but it was elevated. But then I had a horrible case of pneumonia. My respiratory system got hit super hard. I was just tired all the time. I got my strength back fast, but I noticed that I would just be so tired at workouts where I would do a set and then I would have to wait five minutes before doing another one because my respiratory system was just massively hit. Symptoms, the symptoms I have are similar to hear what you hear a lot of people with COVID-19 having. I don't think I had that, but to some extent, I can understand the people with the serious symptoms. So anyway, I made, I made endurance training an integral part of my regimen where I started doing a lot of interval training, elliptical machine. You just get in 30 minutes, bang it out, minute hard, or 30 seconds hard, minute moderate, 30 seconds hard, minute moderate, something like that, something to that effect. And then the blood pressure came into an optimal range really fast. So now that's something I'm definitely going to keep up. But the other thing is I noticed that my energy when I'm lifting weights is way better. Like I was lifting weights yeah. yesterday. I noticed that the, the amount of time I need to take in between sets, I almost have to force myself. Yeah. You know, I was doing heavy work yesterday and I go, okay, let me take three minute breaks for full recovery. And I'm looking at my, my phone watch and I'm going, come on, come on, hurry up, hurry up. I want to sure. get on to the next one as opposed to like, uh oh, that three minutes is almost up. 
So, so, yeah. so you need to have a balance of all of these things as well. And you have to be honest with yourself. So if, if you're saying, yeah, my blood pressure is high, but it's not a big deal, it's like you're just lying to yourself. Yeah. Now, it doesn't have to be at the same exact range of certain other people. You can have, if you're healthy and your blood pressure is a little bit elevated, but you're healthy in other areas, it's not as much of a risk. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't focus on improving it and focus on right. getting it better. Why not get it into that optimal range so it's not a risk at all, as opposed to, oh, I think I can handle having this elevated level. So yeah, well, you I think something to- something simple is adding, like you said, you added more more uh, conditioning work, you added more cardio yeah. type, you know, training. That's important, and it's so looked down upon. You know, people act like yeah. you're going to lose all your muscle if you you add yeah. a few days of cardio. And, you know, I, I mean, you know, for me, I've been, uh, I've been doing jujitsu for about a year and a half now. And you want to talk about conditioning, man. I mean, it's, yeah. it's insane. And, and certainly my, uh, my max effort work has dropped a little bit, but right. like you, you know, I'm able to push through, you know, I'll typically rest a little bit more during my max effort lift or my dynamic effort lift. Um, but my accessory work, I can just go and go and go and go. Yeah. My work capacity is improved. Right. I recover yes. faster. Yeah. Yeah, the accessory work is what I noticed. I did a ton of accessory work yesterday where normally I would just hit my main sets and then leave. And I just felt like I could keep going. So that that made a big difference. And you're right, there is gonna, there's always gonna be a trade-off. If you do a lot of endurance work, maybe your max like my max effort strength is, is much lower now than let's say it was last year. But that's not really something I'm concerned about. I'm not a competitive power lifter. Who who really cares what it is? And I'm getting closer to 50 than I would than 40. So it's being lifting the most I've ever lifted is not really something that, that's a huge concern for me at this point. I still yeah. like doing it, but that's not the primary focus. I want to be healthy. I want to feel good. Yeah. And you want to be able to lift fairly heavy when you're 60, when you're 70, when you're 80. It's not about, you know, that all out grinding max. But if you can constantly bang out heavy fives or heavy triples or something like that, you know, and constantly you know, push and push and push and still feel good and your joints not be locked up and you still got mobility. I mean, that, that's 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 awesome. You know? Yeah, exactly. So you have you have to find that balance. And I think with one thing about the virus that one one thing that I that we didn't hear. You have to go pretty soon. We'll wrap up with this I'm good for about 10 more. I got a client at 430, but I got about 10 more minutes. OK, cool. Yeah. So we'll wrap up with this topic. I mean, you and I were texting about this a little bit during this whole lockdown. Vegas is starting to open up now. I know Atlanta opened up maybe about a month ago. So you guys have been yeah. open for a little while. End, yeah. end of April. Yeah. Yeah. And, and some areas are still locked down. Some areas are starting to open up. But for the most part, most people had two and a half months where they were just at home. And, yeah. and a lot of people were getting paid to be home. And there was, I didn't see a big increase, though, in people engaging in healthy lifestyles now that they have all this time on their hands. Because we always hear, oh, I, I can't work. I don't have the time to do it. No all right. Time. Well, now you have two and a half months where you're getting a stimulus check. You're getting unemployment. You're getting paid to stay home. Now, what are you going to do with that time? Well, I'm going to binge watch Netflix. I haven't, I'm going to catch up on all these shows. <laughs> no, I can, I can watch every episode of what's the one Stranger Things that everyone's talking about. I can, yeah. I, I can watch all three seasons of that in three days. <laughs> yeah. exactly. and, then, and then I'm going to go to the grocery store and load up in a bunch of garbage. Like my friend Ori Ortega, he was on the last episode I recorded. He said he would go to a supermarket in Panama and he's plant-based as well. So he's, he's loading up on fruits and vegetables and all these healthy foods. And then he's looking over at other people's carts and it's Hungry Man meals and donuts and Cheetos and stuff like that. So now people are they're, they're getting even more unhealthy during this whole thing when it was a total opportunity to get into the best shape of your life. I mean, imagine what you could have accomplished in two and a half months, especially someone who's just, just getting back into shape. You're going to make even more progress. You could have done something. You could have just gone for a walk every day a couple of miles and then started eating some healthy foods. And then I see people walking around wearing masks. Now, I know there's a lot of debate on the merits of masks. So if you feel comfortable wearing a mask, by all means, do it. Now, I, I'm, I'm not I haven't really fallen into the narrative that is something that's essential. And I don't think it's necessarily even good for you. But anyway, we won't get into that. But I see people walking around with masks who look like they never had a healthy meal in their life. Yes. <laughs> I, mean, it's, yes. I forget about Getting on a healthy, I was like, you look, you don't look like you've ever had an apple or a salad or a bowl of oatmeal or anything remotely healthy ever. Yet you were quick to, to put on this mask because that's what everyone on TV was saying to do. And first it started with, don't wear the mask. We need that for medical professionals. It doesn't do any good anyway. And then several weeks later, it's, oh, everyone should be wearing a mask. It's like, oh, this virus survives on surfaces for eight hours. It's like, oh, turns out that's not right either. 
It's like, oh, if you're asymptomatic, you can still spread it to a lot of other people. And now the new data from the WHO is saying that we don't really know how much you can spread yeah. when you're asymptomatic. So nobody knows what the hell they're talking about is what we're yeah. going with here. So, but, but so few people that I could see took advantage of this time. Forget about just training. You could have learned some new skills. You could have taken some yes. online courses. You could have done, taken some time to relax too in a, in a healthy way. Yeah. Connect with people that are around you and so forth, and the people in your inner circle or people you live with. But it, it seemed that very few people took advantage of that. And so, so two things that two conclusions I came out of it, and it's not like I didn't know these before. Number one, it's not the time issue. That's not the reason why people don't adopt healthy issues. It doesn't take any more time to eat healthy than it does unhealthy. They're like, well, I can just go to Burger King and get this. I go, yeah, you can go to the grocery store and pick up a few things too. And it takes takes seconds to put together a healthy meal. It doesn't take a lot of effort. And also, you're an adult. <laughs> you, know, you should know how to make a meal, all right? You're a grown man and you can't cook a meal. What does that say about you? You should know how to put yeah. together a couple meals. You shouldn't be so dependent on, like, if your wife or your girlfriend is not around cooking a meal for you, you have to go to Burger King because you're helpless. It's like, you're a grown man. Learn how to make a few meals, it's like a few healthy meals. <laughs> Exactly. And then the other thing is that we've, we, there's often arguments of, hey, we should have guaranteed income where everyone just gets a certain check. It's like, okay, well, now we've, had, now we've seen what would happen if that's actually put in play with the stimulus checks. And what has happened? A lot of people don't want to go back to work because they're getting paid more to stay home. They're going, hey, look, I'm a barber, but I'm getting paid three grand a month to kick back at home. I'm going to ride this out as long as they're willing to pay it. So they're going to keep sending me stimulus checks for another month. I'm not coming back to work for another month. And I see that attitude a lot, actually. I've had, I've had people blatantly tell me that. People I see at the dog park or just elsewhere. And it, it's just so we're, we're creating this welfare nation as well. Yes. And it, it's such an unhealthy attitude of even if I can work, I don't want to because I'm just getting, quote unquote, what they think is free money. It's not free money. Not now. The world that, gonna that's mind blowing that people have that notion, dude. Mind blowing. Yeah, it's 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 out of control. So anyway, at least things are back to normal a little bit now. You're open up. How's how's business at your place? How how did it's you? Good. It's good, man. I'm back to about uh, I'm back to about say 90, 95 percent of my clientele. So yeah. if the if the, you know even if the couple people that that still haven't come back don't come back, I'm not hurting. I'm getting some new contacts. Our jujitsu programs back up and running. Um, we're doing really well here. And for us the shutdown was only, uh, only about a month. It was a little over a month okay. because Georgia was a little bit, yeah, they were a little bit late to the party on the shutdown. Um, you know, Kemp, our governor Kemp came under fire for a lot of that, yeah, but he was also, we were the first ones to open up yeah. and, you know, it wasn't as bad as everybody speculated it was going to be or wanted it. It seemed like they wanted it to be. So we're doing pretty well, you know, and I, I had my online clients when I was shut down, I actually had some people that had me come to their home, do a little bit. I had like nine in-person appointments a week while we were shut down. So I still got out of the house, helped some people at their home gyms and stuff like that. Whether I was right or wrong at doing that, I'm like, shit, you know, these people can have their house. You know, house cleaners are essential. Well, I'll throw a mop in a, in a bucket in my, uh, in my Jeep and I'll just tell them I'm going to clean a house. You know, I mean, with personal training, it's easy to physical distance anyway. Um, so I had enough, you know, where I had enough going on. I got back into some, uh, some video content. And then I just got back into my own, you know, I, I, I made sure I did something every day training wise. Uh, I set up some mats in my basement. I worked on some solo jujitsu drills to work on some skills that I was having a hard time with. Cause it's like you said, if you wasted that time and didn't come out of those 30 days or 60 days or whatever, better than when you went in, what a waste of an opportunity to spend a little bit of time improving yourself, you know? Yeah, no, hundred percent. Absolutely. And here's the final thing I'll say. I worked out at home a lot as well. I kept in shape. And I have a good amount of equipment here. I've got a trap bar. I've got a barbell. I've got kettlebells. And I haven't used kettlebells in a while because I've been going to the gym so much. So that was actually a nice change. I actually enjoy lifting was, kettlebells. Yeah. I actually forgot how much I enjoy. So now I'm going to keep them back in. And then I have an elliptical trainer at the house. So I was able to keep the interval training going. So I, I stayed very active. I probably worked out more during these last two months than, than normal, honestly, because oh, there wasn't a whole lot to do. So most days I'd be like, you know what? A lot of times on days I would rest, I'd be like, nah, I'm going to go upstairs and just bang out an interval training session. Why not? You know, just, I can sleep for an hour afterwards if I need to. I got all the time in the world to recover. So I might as well push it hard right now. But uh, one thing I noticed when I went back to the gym, and I've gone back to – our gym's opened up this, this past week, so I've had a couple sessions there. So there's a lot of things I do there that I wasn't doing at home, hanging leg reses and so forth. 
And when I was doing them regularly before, sometimes you don't really know what it's working because you've been doing it for so long. So I haven't done hanging leg raises in two months. I did three sets of 12 the other day. My abs are still sore. And not only are they sore, I know exactly what's sore. I was like, wow, this is this is what it works. You know, now yeah. you know for sure. When you're doing it all the time, you're going, I don't even know if this is doing anything. You know, I'm just banging out these reps, blah, 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 blah. You don't do it for two months and then you do it. You're like, wow, that's what it works. I did dragon flag. I was like, wow, that's what that works. Like my whole body is sore from just all these exercises that I normally do, but I haven't had a chance to do. So now you know what, it's a nice little shock to the systems where I'm going it with is. this. It's a positive thing. It's a benefit. I went the other way on those, Mike, because I hadn't been doing hanging leg raises a lot in my program. Yeah. I've been doing a lot of ground-based abs, you know, right. I mean, especially right. with, with, with uh, jiu-jitsu training. I do a lot of stuff on the mats without my feet and my back. So I've been getting really tight in my abs, my hip flexors, my, my adductors. Yeah. So I've got a TAPS unit down in my basement. So I, I just had a deadlift. You know, I brought a bar from the gym. I set up a deadlift area in my basement, some grappling mats. I had my TAPS unit and some kettlebells and some power blocks. I got back into doing the hanging leg raises and I sucked at them at first, but I yeah. spent that month, you know, that was my main ab exercise and mm -hmm. I got so much better at them. And I'm glad I did, man, because it's such yeah. a great exercise. Yeah, it is. It is. That's really cool. And then uh, actually here's, here's one final point. I had a little bit of exchange with Freddie Madball of Madball. Oh, cool, cool. You're a big hardcore fan. During this whole thing, I just checked in on him to see how he's doing and so forth. And we're talking about when are concerts going to start getting rolling again. And it's going to be probably a while, although I, I got to tell you this. I was shocked to find out that Billy Idol's doing a concert next month at the Pearl here in Vegas. Really? Rob Stewart is starting to do gigs again. Sting is doing something at Caesars Palace. And this is all July, August. And I looked at the ticket sales, and I go, wow, how, what are they doing here? Is it every six seats or something? No. Yeah. They're selling seats the way it normally would be. Now I don't know if they're gonna if there if there's a resurge or something like that. I don't know what's gonna happen. But but Vegas didn't get super hard hit hard either, just like Georgia did. And but yeah. I understand the mentality of people that are in New York City and places like London got hit super hard, London, England. Yeah. So people out there have a much different perspective, and I get it. I get it. So anyway, before I keep going on here, I'll, I see you got to wrap up. So let's go ahead and let's just give you a plug. Uh, what's your website and then your Instagram handle? Yeah, absolutely, man. So uh, my website is uh, eptsgym.com, eptsgym.com. Uh, if people go to there, I've got links to everything that I'm doing, man. I got the links to my my books that I do for plant-based performance, my personal stuff, my blogs there, my podcast, all my shit is there, links to my social media. But my Instagram, I got two. I got eptsatl is my gym Instagram, and then my personal is shetler 613 So that's if people want to follow me on Instagram, that's how to get to it. Yeah, and everyone should follow you. You put up a lot of great content. You have a lot of great content on YouTube as well. And then your book is on plant-based eating for people who want to get into that. Where can they get that? That's on Amazon. Oh, the book. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, the the book that I did with Stick is uh, yeah. Yeah. it's it's selling on Amazon. It's called Eat Plants, Lift Iron. Um, it detailed the progress that I, I worked with Stick from Dead Prez and his goal to put on 20 pounds of muscle on a whole food plant-based diet. His wife, Afia, was the uh, nutritionist through it all, so the three of us worked together. Eat Plants, Lift Iron is the name of the book. It's available on Amazon, I believe, but his website for it is RBG Fit Club. It's for Reaching Bigger Goals, fitclub.com, and they sell the book on there as well, so he handles all the sales and stuff, but it's, yeah. a, it's a really inspiring book, and, and what he did was really it. amazing. Yeah. yeah, great book. You guys did a great job on that. I, I actually that was, heard of that fairly often. You guys do a really did a really good job on that. And that's great for people who think, okay, am I going to just have to down protein shakes all day long? No, yeah. it's it's just pure whole food. Whole food. Yeah. Man. Awesome. Yeah, was, great talking to you, man. I appreciate it. I know you're busy, so we'll see you later. And you have a great day, man. I appreciate it. You too, Mike. Let's do this again soon, man. Oh, hey, a uh, quick shout out to our buddy Sincere, man. Today's his birthday. I saw. Happy birthday. Oh, yeah, I'm going to have to hit him up on that. <laughs> oh, sorry, man. Didn't mean to stick you out. But... <laughs> no, no. Cool, man. I'll, I'll definitely hit him up. Cool, man. You have a... You have